Pikes Peak, America's most famous mountain. Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike first saw the peak on the afternoon of November 15, 1806. He was not the first to see it. He attempted to climb it, but did not reach the summit. Incredibly, railroad trains now carry sightseers to the summit of Pikes Peak and have done so since June of 1891. In the 1930s, the Depression made the Cog Railroad's depot a quiet place. Although fancy touring cars seldom bring passengers anymore, that same depot still welcomes arriving passengers. There is an air of excitement as passengers arrive at this quaint 1891 building and purchase tickets for the ascent of America's most famous mountain. Waiting for the train is a little more relaxing with hummingbirds entertaining. Of course, passengers can explore the antique steam locomotive on display near the depot, or simply enjoy the flowers and anticipate the trip through Colorado's mountain peaks. There is a small building across the tracks from the depot. Years ago, other passengers once arrived here from Manitou Springs. That building is now the railroad's offices, but was once a trolley station with a unique feature. Ruxton Creek actually runs under it. You can see that same tunnel in the lower left. The building over the creek was the trolley station. The tracks of the Manitou Electric Railway and Casino Company in the foreground once brought passengers up from downtown Manitou Springs. Near the shops is the coal dock that once fed hungry steam engines. Passengers look up toward the shop as a few bells are heard and their train starts down to the depot. The excitement returns as anticipation for the trip runs as high as the 14,110-foot mountain the train will climb. from the dispatcher and our train is ready to leave. Peak is a cog railway. Our train can climb 25 feet for each 100 feet it moves forward. An ordinary railroad train has difficulty climbing four feet in that same distance. The cog system used by our railroad is called an abt rack, named after Swiss engineer Roman Abt who invented it. The offset teeth cut into a center rack rail mesh with gears called cog wheels under our train, providing all the propulsion. The outer rails are just used to balance the train. Cog railway switches have many moving parts. Our train climbs through the Pike National Forest. With 1,400,000 acres, this forest is larger than the state of Delaware. It's the third largest in Colorado and includes many historical and recreational sites. The distance from the depot is marked on mileposts along the track. Our train arrives at Minnehaha, the location of a passing siding by which we will get by the first of two downhill trains we will encounter, as this is a busy railroad. Our conductor throws the switch that will allow the trains to pass. The passing sidings were not built until 1976. Sharp-eyed passengers spot Minnehaha Falls. Those same falls appear on this historic photo amid the few summer homes once built on the 35 lots here. 
Established by a Nebraska professor, the Alpine Laboratory once conducted research in high-altitude flora. Meanwhile, the downhill train has arrived, and we can again continue our journey to Pikes Peak. Today, it is hard to believe that cabins, a laboratory, and even a hotel, the Minnehaha House, once graced these hillsides. Today, a water tank that once quenched thirsty steam engines is all that remains. At Son of a Gun Hill, our train climbs a 25% grade. It was named by steam locomotive firemen who had to shovel a lot of coal to climb this hill. Next to Ruxton Creek are the remains of a small cabin. Years ago, hikers were allowed along the railroad, and this cabin's last use was as a refreshment stand. The spire on the right is Eagle's Roost, while on the left is Castle's Dome. Together, they form Hellgate, the only natural gateway to the summit of Pikes Peak. Thomas Palsgrove, shown here with his wife Nettie and children Harry and Mary, built a one-room cabin at the head of Engelman Canyon in 1882. Intending to run cattle, Thomas also sold refreshments to weary hikers and by 1884 had opened a hotel. The hotel became popular and was expanded to 15 rooms. The railroad and the siding it built contributed to the hotel's increasing popularity. A small station included a refreshment stand and post office. Closed in 1916, it was damaged by fire in 1922 and raised in 1926. A water tank remains to mark the spot. The ruins of two cabins mark the beginning of Ruxton Park, a former town site. Lots sold for $25 to $200. Still inhabited, it is home to caretakers for the Colorado Springs Watershed Lakes and the oldest hydroelectric plant west of the Mississippi. The town was developed by Thomas Palsgrove of the Halfway House. A settling basin was built in the early 1900s. Water from this basin travels to the hydroelectric plant across from the railroad shops in Manitou Springs. The caretaker's driveway is 60 miles long, discouraging quick trips to town. At mile four, we can see the path of our tracks on the big hill, high on Sackett Mountain. Mountain View is the longest straight track on the railroad, three quarters of a mile. An old railroad coach rests here as a shelter for track workers and hikers from the bar trail. The offices of the Pikes Peak Daily News stood at Old Mountain View, a little downhill of the present location. Passengers' names were gathered on the uphill train. By the time the train returned downhill, an edition of the paper with these names was ready to be sold. Steam locomotives once took water at Mountain View, and an operational water tank remains here. Each autumn, the bright green leaves of aspen trees change to brilliant shades of yellow and orange. A member of the poplar family, they are often called quaking aspen after the shimmering of their leaves. And if you'll start to look in the valley below us to the 16th side of the train, you'll see a large group of rocks. You are now looking upon the lion's stand, and as I just mentioned, that was as high as Lieutenant Pike and his expedition made it.
At Grecian Bend, our train begins its climb up the track that will take us above Timberline, track called the Big Hill. Passengers always wonder about the train's steering wheel. The engineer uses it to control the train's speed and brakes. From the very beginning, track work was critical to the railroad's excellent safety record. Today's track crew carries on that grand tradition. It is difficult but essential work in searing sun and biting cold, performed at high altitudes. A typical day starts with loading ties onto a flat car. All the railroad's 52,000 ties and eight and three quarters miles of track rail must be regularly replaced for safe operation. Today, those ties are unloaded just below 12,000 feet. First, the bolts that hold the rack rail to the tie must be removed by unscrewing and then pulling them out. Next, the spikes holding the tie to the outside rails are removed. The worn tie is dug out, loosened, and removed to be discarded. Once the new tie has been inserted, it is forced up against the rails. Spikes fasten the outside rails to the tie. Finally, holes are drilled to fasten the rack rail to the tie, and bolts set in these holes are driven home. Day's End sees this seldom seen crew heading home for a well-deserved rest. Lake Moraine is the first of seven lakes that are part of the Colorado Springs watershed. It is also called the Calendar Mountain because of its height, 12,365 feet above sea level. We will meet another train here at Windy Point. First, the work train arrives to clear the main line for our train. Years ago, to save the slow, steam-driven trip to work, the section foreman, his family, and the section crew lived in this stone building while maintaining the track. You may have noticed a problem. Three trains need to pass, and only one siding is available. A very clever dance of the cog trains allows all three to go their way. The work train enters the siding, and our train appears.
train uses the lower switch to return to the main line, downhill of our train. The downhill train arrives and uses the siding to pass both our train and the work train. Our train continues uphill and the work train returns to replacing ties. Extraordinary alpine views are everywhere as the breeze acquires the chill of altitude. This is Pikes Peak granite broken into small pieces by the freezing of water that has seeped into the porous rock. Our conductor points out a small spot out there in the field. A pump house and reservoir supplied water to the tank at Windy Point. An employee carried coal from the track to fire the boiler that pumped the water. Along with room and board, he received one dollar a day. The original Windy Point tank no longer exists. This was the highest water tank on the railroad, enabling the thirsty steam locomotives to reach the summit. Marmot, a small animal, is often seen by passengers above Timberline, as our Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. The saddle between Pikes Peak and Sackett Mountain features views of the mountains to the west and Colorado Springs to the east. Timbers, used to keep wagons from sinking into the mud on an old wagon road, remind us that there are other ways up. Dr. Edwin James was the first to climb the peak in 1820. Julia Holmes was the first woman to climb it in 1858. Hiking the railroad was popular, but is no longer allowed. Fred Barr owned the borough concession on Mount Manitou and built a new trail to the summit between 1914 and 1918. Years before, Zalman Simmons rode a burrow to the summit and was convinced from his discomfort to build the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway. Simmons also manufactured mattresses. Horses were used as well as burrows. Huntley and Carlisle operated carriages to the summit from the Colorado Midland Railway Station in Cascade. This became the Pikes Peak <gasps> Auto Highway in 1915, a toll road. At 14,110 feet, Pikes Peak is the 32nd highest in Colorado. It stands alone on the edge of the plains. Visible for miles, it became the symbol of the American West. We have arrived at the summit of America's most famous mountain. While some passengers head for the refreshments and shop of the Summit House, others pose for pictures, proving their adventure to relatives back home. Views of aspen-covered, lake-frilled valleys grace the south. 
Gold Hill and the mines of Cripple Creek appear to the west. The picturesque mountain town of Woodland Park and Rampart Reservoir are to the north. On a clear day, you can see Denver and even Kansas. The red rocks of the Garden of the Gods decorate the eastern view, and downtown Colorado Springs towers above the plains. A stone wall of the original Summit House remains. The new Summit House opened in 1964. Like the new Summit House, the old facility sold gifts and refreshments. It was originally built in 1882 as a weather station by the U.S. Army Signal Service. The weather station closed and the newly remodeled building included a tourist hotel for 15 guests. Before 1900, a steel tower was built above the hotel rooms on the north end of the building. An additional charge allowed the tourists to climb even higher. Not as silly as it may seem, the view to the west especially was improved by gaining elevation over the wide flat summit. The choir of Denver's Highlands Christian Church was first to reach the summit on June 30th, 1891. Since then, the summit has hosted every imaginable activity. In the pleasant fall weather of 1912, the Colorado Midland Railway Band entertained on the summit. However, our time on the summit is over and we must begin our return. Of 1889, grading began at the summit. A four foot November snow ended work above Timberline. Pay was 18 cents an hour for grueling high altitude labor without animals or machinery. Track laying started at the bottom in June 1890 and was completed by October 20th. The first passenger train reached the summit on June 30th, 1891. Snow is a continuing battle for the railroad. Snow can fall any time of the year on Pikes Peak, but clearing the track in the spring is most difficult. From the earliest days, snow was removed by pushing a flat car plow into the drifts. The plow is backed away and men shovel the snow off the car, a grueling job at these high altitudes. By 1973, snow removal still had not changed much. A diesel locomotive now pushed the flat car plow into the snow and backed away with tons of white powder while men still suffered the task of shoveling that snow off. A hydraulic lift was added to dump snow off the flat car. The railroad built a rotary snowplow in 1952. The machine was not completely successful and the old plowing method remained. No matter what the plow, very deep snow must be blasted down to a height within the plow's capacity. Explosives are tamped into a snow hole and detonated. By 1974, a new rotary plow built by American Snowblast had finally retired the flat car.
A new plow resembles and works like a giant snowblower. Yet hand shovelers must still clear away ice frozen to the track. Like all gears, the rack rail must be lubricated. In early years, an employee applied lubricant to each tooth with a brush. The lubricant hardened every few hundred yards and a fire was built to soften it. It took a month to traverse the railroad. Now, automatic lubricators are on the trains. With all these rocks around, one occasionally falls on the track. Explosives are placed and the many-ton rock is blasted into pieces that can be removed easily. That boulder was made of Pikes Peak granite, unique to this mountain. It is pinkish, soft, and prone to weathering. In 1938, Swing was king and the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway built its first streamliner. Not only was this car faster than the steamers, but it reduced maintenance and operating costs. Car 7 carried 24 passengers and still exists. Car 7 was so successful that five diesel-electric streamlined trains were eventually built. These trains consisted of a locomotive and a coach carrying 52 passengers. Some of these locomotives still operate, mostly on work trains. One streamlined coach was restored by the railroad and still sees occasional service on special passenger trains. In 1963, the first of four Swiss-built rail cars was delivered. Each carries 80 passengers and still sees service when smaller trains are needed. These cars are diesel-electric, powered by Cummins diesels. These 80-passenger trains were built by the Swiss Locomotive and Machine Works. Like the newer 216-passenger twin units, they were tested in Switzerland. The shops of the Swiss Locomotive and Machine Works are in Winterthur, Switzerland. Here is the first twin-unit train prior to testing. Only half of the train was tested on the Arth Rigibon, a cog railroad in Switzerland. Extensive testing included engineering analysis of data gathered from instruments on the train. The Manitou and Pikes Peak train meets two Arth Riggy Bond trains. Mount Riggy is the only peak served by two cog railways. The second track is the Vitznau Riggy Bond. In 1976, the first twin unit trains were delivered. These weigh 73 tons and are 124 feet long. Inspired by an 1893 carriage trip to the summit, Catherine Lee Bates wrote the words to the song we know as America the Beautiful. Railroad employees maintain equipment during the winter. Here an engine is removed to overhaul its transmission.
These engines are made by Cummins in the United States. Once the engine has been removed, the rails are replaced and the train moved away. With the train gone, the rails are again removed to allow the engine to be lifted. Transmission made by Twin Disc in the United States is removed for later overhaul and replaced with a previously rebuilt transmission. No job is small and even the flywheel must be removed with a hoist. The Pikes Peak Power Company's generating plant once hummed below Son of a Gun Hill. Engelman Canyon was named for George Engelman a 19th century English botanist who explored this area. The last operating steam locomotive waits to welcome our train. Steam locomotives provided the power for the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway for many years. Seven steamers were built for the railway. Cog locomotives are different from ordinary steam locomotives, requiring special rods to transfer power to the cog wheel. Manitou and Pikes Peak locomotives were small, around 25 to 30 tons. Locomotive 4 powered the last steam passenger trip in 1958, and no one expected to see steam again. But that locomotive was retrieved from a museum, restored, and ran again in 1980. This locomotive was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia in 1897.
And on behalf of your engineer Jim and myself, I would like to thank all of you for riding aboard the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway this afternoon. I hope you had a memorable trip. Memorable indeed. As our train arrives at the depot, we have climbed to the top of 14,000 foot Pikes Peak and returned. Exhilarated travelers now return to life at lower elevations.